there. Festival. Tonight, we are proud to present the tragedy of Richard III. Ooh. But before we begin, we have a few simple rules. Please silence all cell phones and digital devices. Photography and video recording of any kind are strictly prohibited. And since the house lights will remain on throughout the entire performance, we will know who you are. In the event of an emergency, their exits located on either side of the stage and back through the lobby. Ushers are available to offer further assistance. And now we invite you to travel to 15th century England as we present to you the tragedy of Richard III. <laughs> Discontent. 
made glorious summer by this son of York. And all the clouds that lowered upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. Now are our brows bound with victorious wreaths, our bruised arms hung up for monuments, our stern alarms changed to merry meetings, our dreadful marches to delightful measures. Grim-visaged war hath smoothed his wrinkled front, and now, instead of mounting barbed steeds to fright the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nimbly in a lady's chamber to the lascivious pleasings of a lute. But I that am not shaped for sportive tricks, nor made to court an amorous looking glass, I that am rudely stamped, Want love's majesty, distraught before a wanton, ambling nymph. I that am curtailed of this fair proportion, cheated of feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world, scarce half made up, and that's so lamely and unfashionable that dogs bark at me as I halt by them. Why, I, in this weak, piping time of peace, have no delight to pass away the time, unless to see my shadow in the sun and descant on mine own deformity. And therefore, since I cannot prove a lover, I am determined to prove a villain. Plots have I laid, inductions dangerous, by drunken prophecies, libels, dreams, set my brother Clarence and the king in deadly hate, the one against the other. And if King Edward be as true and just as I am subtle, false, and treacherous, this day should Clarence closely be mewed up about a prophecy which says that G of Edward's heirs the murderer shall be. Dive thoughts down to my soul. Here Clarence comes. Brother, good day. What means this armed guard that waits upon your grace? His majesty, tendering my person's safety, hath appointed this conduct to convey me to the tower. Upon what cause? Because I'm christened George. Alack, my lord, that fault is none of yours. He should for that commit your godfathers. He hearkens after prophecies and dreams and says a wizard told him that by G his issue disinherited should be. But for my name of George begins with G, it follows in his thought that I am he. Why, this it is when men are ruled by women. It is not the king that sends you the tower, my lady Grey. Why, Clarence, is she that tempts him to this harsh extremity, and may you send Lord Hastings to the tower, from whence this present day he is delivered? We are not safe, Clarence. We are not safe. I beseech your grace is full to pardon me. And his majesty has certainly given in charge that no man shall have private conference, of what degree soever, with your brother. You may partake of anything we say, ma'am. We speak no treason. We say the king is wise and virtuous, and his queen fair and not jealous. I do beseech your grace to pardon me, and withal forbear your conference with the noble duke. We know thy charge, sirrah, and will obey. Brother, farewell. I will on to the king. Meantime, this deep disgrace in brotherhood touches me deeper than you can imagine. It pleaseth neither of us well. Well, your imprisonment shall not be long. I will deliver you, or else lie for you. Meantime, have patience. I must perforce. Farewell. Go tread the path that thou shalt ne'er return. Simple, plain Clarence. I do love thee so that I will shortly send thy soul to heaven. 
if heaven will take the present at our hands. But who comes here? The newly delivered Hastings. Good time of day unto my gracious lord. As much unto my good lord Chamberlain. Well are you welcome to this open air. How hath your lordship brooked imprisonment? Oh, with patience, noble lord, as prisoners must. <laughs> what news abroad? No news so bad abroad as this at home. The king is sickly, weak, and melancholy, and his physicians fear him mightily. Well, by St. John, that news is bad indeed. Oh, he hath kept an evil diet long, and overmuch consumed his royal person. It is very grievous to be thought upon. Where is he? In his bed. He is. Go you before, and I will follow you. He cannot live, I hope, and must not die till George be packed with post horse up to heaven. I'll in to urge his hatred to our brother with lies well steeled with weighty arguments. And if I fail not in my deep intent, Clarence hath not another day to live. Which done, God take King Edward to his mercy and leave the world for me to bustle in. For then I'll marry Warwick's youngest daughter. What? Though I killed her husband and her father, the readiest way to make the wench amends is to become her husband and her father. But yet I run before my horse to market. Clarence still breathes, Edward still lives and reigns. When they are gone, then must I count my gains. lament the untimely fall of virtuous Lancaster. Poor, key, cold figure of a holy king, pale ashes of the house of Lancaster, thou bloodless remnant of that royal blood. Be it lawful that I invocate thy ghost to hear the lamentations of poor Anne, Wife, to thy Edward, to thy slaughtered son, stabbed by the selfsame hands that made these wounds. Oh, cursed be the hands that made these holes. Cursed the heart that had the heart to do it. Cursed the blood that let this blood from hence. More direful hath betide that hated wretch that makes us wretched by the death of thee that I could wish to wolves to spiders, toads, or any creeping venom thing that lives. If ever he have child, aborted be it, prodigious and untimely brought to light, whose ugly and unnatural aspect may fright the hopeful mother at the view, and that be heir to his unhappiness. If ever he have wife, let her be made more miserable by the death of him than I am made by my young lord and thee. Stay you and bear the corpse and set it down. My lord, stand back and let the coffin pass. Unmanned dog, standst thou when I command? Dance thy halberd higher than my breast, or by St. Paul I'll strike thee to my foot! What? Do you tremble? Are you all afraid? Alas, I blame you not, for you are all mortal, and mortal eyes cannot endure the devil! Avant, thou dreadful minister of hell! Thou hadst but power over his mortal body. His soul, 
thou canst not have. Therefore be gone! Saints, charity, be not so cursed. Foul devil! For God's sake, hence and trouble us not, for thou hast made this happy earth thy hell, filled it with cursing cries and deep exclaims. If thou delight to view thy heinous deeds, behold the dispatterns of thy butcheries. <gasps> oh, gentlemen, see, see dead Henry's wounds. Open their congealed mouths and bleed afresh. Blush, blush thy lump of foul deformity, for tis thy presence that exhales this blood from cold and empty veins where no blood dwells. Thy deeds, inhuman and unnatural, provokes this deluge most unnatural. Oh, God, which this blood makes revenge his death. Revenge his death. Either heaven with lightning strike this murderer dead, or earth gape open wide and eat him quick, as thou dost swallow up this good king's blood, which his hell governed arms hath butchered. Lady, you know no rules of charity, which renders good for bad, blessings for curses. Philip. Thou knowst no law of God, nor man, no beast so fierce but know some touch of pity. But I know none, and therefore am no beast. Oh, wonderful, when devils tell the truth. More wonderful when angels are so angry. Fairer than tongue can name thee, let me have some patient leisure to excuse myself. Fouler than heart can think thee. Thou canst make no excuse current but to hang thyself. By such despair I should accuse myself. And by despairing thou shalt stand excused for doing worthy vengeance on thyself that did unworthy slaughter upon others. Say that I slew them not. Then say they were not slain, but dead they are and devilish slain by thee. I did not kill your husband. Why, then? He is alive. Nay, he is dead, and slain by Edward's hands. In thy foul throat thou liest. Queen Margaret saw thy murderous falchion smoking in his blood, the which thou once did bend against her breast, but that thy brothers beat aside the point. I was provoked by her slanderous tongue, which laid their guilt upon my guiltless shoulders. Thou was provoked by thy bloody mind that never dreamst on aught but butcheries. Did thou not kill this king? I grant ye. <clears throat> Dost grant me, hedgehog? Then God grant me too thou mayst be damned for that wicked deed. He was gentle, mild, and virtuous. The better for the king of heaven that hath him. He is in heaven, where thou shalt never come. For he was fitter for that place than earth. And thou unfit for any place but hell. Yes, one place else, if you'll hear me name it. Some dungeon. Your bedchamber. Ill rest betide the chamber where thou lies. So will it, madam, till I lie with you. But, gentle Lady Anne, to leave this keen encounter of our wits and fall somewhat into a slower method. Is not the causer of the timeless deaths of these Plantagenets, Henry and Edward, as blameful as the executioner? Thou was the cause and most accursed effect. Your beauty was the cause of that effect. Your beauty that did haunt me in my sleep to undertake the death all the world, so I might live one hour in your sweet bosom. If I thought that, I'd tell thee homicide. These nails should burst that beauty from my cheeks. These eyes could not endure sweet beauty's rack. Should not blemish it if I stood by. As all the world is cheered by the sun, so I by that. It is my day, my life. 
Black night or shade thy day, and death thy life. Curse not thyself, fair creature. Thou art both. I would I were to be revenged on thee. It is a quarrel most unnatural to be revenged on him that loveth thee. It is a quarrel just and reasonable to be revenged on him that killed my husband. He that bereft the lady of her husband did it to help thee to a better husband. His better doth not breathe upon this earth. He lives that loves thee better than he could. Name him. Plantagenet. Why, that was he. The selfsame name, but one of better nature. Where is he? Here. <laughs> Why dost thou spit at me? Would it were mortal poison for thy sake? Never came poison from so sweet a place. Never hung poison on a fowler toad. Out of my sight thou dost infect mine eyes. Thine eyes, sweet lady, have infected mine. They were basilisks to strike thee dead. I would they were, for now they kill me with a living death. I never sued to friend nor enemy. My tongue could never learn sweet smoothing word. But now thy beauty is proposed my fee. My proud heart sues and prompts my tongue to speak. Teach not thy lips such scorn, for it was made for kissing, lady, not for such contempt. If thy revengeful heart cannot forgive, lo, here I lend thee this sharp pointed sword, which if thou please to hide in this true breast, and let forth the soul that adoreth thee, I lay it naked to the deadly stroke. Nay, do not pause, for I did kill King Henry, but t'was thy beauty that provoked me. Nay, now dispatch, t'was I that stabbed young Edward, but t'was thy heavenly face that set me on. Take up the sword again, or take up me. Arise, December. Although I wish thy death, I will not be thy executioner. Then bid me kill myself, and I will do it. I have already. That was in thy rage. Speak it again, and even with the word, this hand, which for thy love did kill thy love, shall for thy love kill a far truer love. To both their deaths shalt thou be accessory. I would I knew thy heart. Tis figured in my tongue. Well, we'll put up your sword. Say then, my peace is made. That thou shalt know hereafter. But shall I live in hope? All men, I hope, live so. Vouchsafe to wear this ring. Look how my ring encompasseth thy finger. Even so thy breast encloseth my poor heart. Where both of them, for both of them are thine. And if thy poor devoted servant may but beg one favor at thy gracious hand, thou dost confirm his happiness forever. What is it? That it may please you leave these sad designs to him that hath most cause to be a mourner, and presently repair to Crosby House, where, after I have solemnly interred at Chertsey Monastery this noble king, and wet his grave with my repentant tears, I will with all expedient duty see you. I beseech you, grant me this boon. All my heart, and much it joys me too to see you become so penitent. Bid me farewell. Tis more than you deserve, but 
since you teach me how to flatter you, imagine I have said farewell already. Keep her long. What? I that killed her husband and his father to take her in her heart's extremist hates with curses in her mouth, tears in her eyes, the, the bleeding witness of my hatred by having God, her conscience, and all these bars against me, and I no friends to back my suit with all but the plain devil and dissembling looks, and yet to win her? <laughs> I do mistake my person all this while. Upon my life she finds, although I cannot myself to be a marvelous proper man. <laughs> I'll be at charges for a looking glass and entertain a score or two of tailors to study fashions to adorn my body. And since I'm crept in favor with myself, I will maintain it with some little cost. Shine out, fair son. Till I have bought a glass, that I may see my shadow as I pass. Have patience, madam. There's no doubt his majesty will soon recover his accustomed health. In that you brook it ill, it makes him worse. Therefore, for God's sakes, entertain good comfort, and cheer his grace with quick and merry eyes. If he were dead, what would betide on me? No other harm but loss of such a lord. The loss of such a lord includes all harms. The heavens have blessed you with a goodly son to be your comforter when he is gone. Ah, he is young, and his minority is put unto the trust of Richard Gloucester, a man that loves not me nor none of you. Is it concluded that he shall be protector? It is determined, not concluded yet, but so it must be if the king miscarry. Here comes the Lord of Buckingham and Stanley. Good time of day unto your royal grace. Saw you the king today. But now the Duke of Buckingham and I are come from visiting his majesty. What likelihood of his amendment, lords? Madam, good hope his grace speaks cheerfully. God grant him health. Did you confer with him? Aye, aye, madam. He desires to make atonement between the Duke of Gloucester and your brothers, and between them and my Lord Chamberlain, and sent to warn them to his royal presence. Would all were well, but that will never be. I fear our happiness is at the height. Who is it that complains unto the king that I forsooth them stern, and love them not? Because I cannot flatter and look fair, smile in men's faces smooth, Deceive and cog, I must be held a rancorous enemy. Cannot a plain man live and think no harm, but that his simple truth must be abused with silken, sly, insinuating jacks. To who in all this presence speaks, Your Grace? To thee, that hast to nor honesty nor grace. When have I injured thee? When done thee wrong? Or thee? or thee, or any of your faction. A plague upon you all. His royal grace cannot be quiet, scarce a breathing while, but you must trouble him with lewd complaints. Brother of Gloucester, you mistake the matter. The king on his own royal disposition, and not provoked by any suitor else, Aiming belike at your interior hatred that in your outward action shows itself against my children. Brothers and myself makes him to send. 
that he may learn the ground. I cannot tell. The world has grown so bad. Since every jack become a gentleman, there's many a gentle person made a jack. Come, come, we know your meaning, Brother Gloucester. You envy my advancement and my friends. God grant we never may have need of you. Meantime, God grants that I have need of you. Our brother is imprisoned by your means, myself disgraced, and the nobility held in contempt, while daily promotions are given to ennoble those that scarce some two days since were worth a noble. I never did incense his majesty against the Duke of Clarence, but have been an earnest advocate to plead for him. <laughs> My lord, you do me shameful injury, falsely to draw me in these vile suspects. You may deny that you are not the mean of my lord Hastings' late imprisonment. She may, my lord. She may, Lord, lord Rivers. I who knows not so. She may do more, sir, than denying that. She may help you to many fair preferments, and deny her aiding hand therein, and lay those honors upon your high desert. What she may not, she may. I marry may she. What marry may she? What marry may she? Marry with a king, a bachelor, and a handsome stripling, too. My lord of Gloucester, I have too long borne your blunt upbraidings and your bitter scoffs. By heaven, I will acquaint his majesty of those gross taunts which off I have endured. I had rather be a country servant maid than a great queen with this condition to be so baited, scorned, and stormed at. Small joy have I in being England's queen. And let it be that small God I was teaching, thy honor, state, and siege is due to... What? Threat you me with telling of the king? I will avouch in the presence of the king. I dare adventure to be sent to the tower. It is time to speak. My pains are quite forgot. Oh, devil! I do remember them too well. Thou killed my husband Henry in the tower, and Edward, my poor son, and she was free. Ere you were queen, I, or your husband, king, I was a pack horse in his great affairs. To royalize his blood, I spent mine own. I, and much better blood than he. You and your husband Grey were factious for the house of Lancaster. And Rivers, so were you. Was not your husband in Margaret's battle at St. Albans slain? A murderous villain, and so still thou Poor Clarence did forsake his father Warwick. I am forswear himself, which, Jesu pardon, which God revenge. to fight on Edward's party for the crown. Before his mead, poor lord, he is mewed up. I would to God my heart were flint like Edward's, or Edward soft and pitiful like mine. I am too childish foolish for this world. Fly me to hell for shame, and leave this world. My lord of Gloucester, in those busy days which here you urge to prove us enemies, we followed then our lord our sovereign king. So should we you, if you should be our king. If I should be, if I had rather be a peddler, <laughs> far be it from my heart the thought thereof. As little joy, my lord, as you suppose you should enjoy, were you this country's king, as little joy you may suppose in me that I enjoy being the queen thereof. A little joy enjoys the queen thereof. For I am she, and altogether joyless. I can no longer hold me patient. Hear me, you wrangling pirates that fall out and sharing that which you have pilled from me. Which of you trembles not that looks on me? Foul wrinkled witch, what makes thou in my sight? Wert thou not banished upon pain of death? I was. But I do find more pain in banishment than death can yield me here by my abode. A husband and a son thou owest to me, and thou a kingdom. All of you allegiance. Curse my noble father laid on thee when thou didst crown his warlike brows with paper. 
till his bitter scorns drew rivers from his eyes. And then to dry them, caves the duke a clout, steeped in the faultless blood of pretty Rutland. <laughs> oh, t'was the foulest deed to slay that babe. Tyrants themselves wept when it was reported. No man but prophesied revenge for it. What? Were you snarling all before I came, ready to catch each other by the throat, and turn you all your hatred now on me? Did York's dread curse prevail so much with heaven that Henry's death, my lovely Edward's death, their kingdom's loss, my woeful banishment, should all but answer for that peevish brat? Can curses pierce the clouds and enter heaven? Why then give way, dull clouds, to my quick curses? Though not by war, by surfeit die your king, as ours by murder to make him a king. Edward, thy son, that now is Prince of Wales, for Edward, our son, that was Prince of Wales, die in his youth by like untimely violence. Thyself a queen, for me that was a queen, outlive thy glory like my wretched self. Lo, mayst thou live to wail thy children's death and see another as I see thee now, decked in thy rights as thou art stalled in mine. Long die thy happy days before thy death, and after many lengthened hours of grief, die neither mother, wife, nor England's queen. Rivers and Dorset, you were standers by, and so wast thou, Lord Hastings, when my son was stabbed with bloody daggers. God, I pray him that none of you may live his natural age, but by some unlooked accident cut off. Have done thy charm, you hateful withered hag. And leave out thee. Stay, dog, for you shalt hear me. If heaven have any grievous plague in store, exceeding those that I can wish upon thee, oh, let them keep it till thy sins be ripe, and then hurl down their indignation on thee, the troubler of the poor world's peace. The worm of conscience still benaw thy soul. Thy friends suspect for traitors while thou livest and take deep traitors for thy dearest friends. No sleep close up that deadly eye of thine, unless it be while some tormenting dream affrights thee with the hell of ugly devils. Thou elvish marked, abortive, rooting hog, thou slander of thy heavy mother's womb, thou rag of honor, thou detested Margaret, have you breathed your curse against yourself? Poor painted queen, vain flourish of my fortune. Why strew'st thou sugar on that bottled spider whose deadly web ensnared thee about? Fool, fool thou wast a knife to kill thyself. The day will come that thou shalt wish for me to help thee curse this poisonous bunched back toad. False boding woman, end thy frantic curse. Lest thou harm, thou move our patience. Foul shame upon you. You have all moved mine. Were you well served, you would be taught your duty. Dispute not with her. She is lunatic. Peace, peace for shame, if not for charity. Urge neither charity nor shame to me. My charity is outrage. Life my shame. And in that shame still live my sorrow's rage. Have done. Have done. Oh, princely Buckingham, I will kiss thy hand and sign a bleed and have you with thee. Now fair fall in thy noble house. Thy garments are not spotted with our blood, root thou from the compass of my curse. Oh, Buckingham, take 
What doth she say, my lord of Buckingham? Nothing. That I respect my gracious lord. What dost thou scorn me for my gentle counsel? And suit the devil that I warn thee from. <laughs> but remember this another day when he shall split thy belly. And to hear her curses. And so doth mine. I muse why she's at liberty. I cannot blame her. By God's holy mother, she hath had too much wrong. And I repent my part thereof, having done to her. I never did her any to my knowledge. Yet you have all the vantage of her wrong. Madam, his majesty doth call for you, and for your grace. And yours, my gracious lord. Catesby, I come. Lords, will you go with me? We wait upon your grace. I do the wrong, and first begin to brawl. The secret mischiefs that I set a broach, I lay on to the grievous charge of others. Thus do I clothe my naked villainy with odd, Old end, stone forth of holy writ, and seem most a saint when I most play the devil. But soft, here come my executioners. How now, my hardy, stout, resolved mates? Are you now going to dispatch this thing? We are, my lord, and come to have the warrant, that he may be admitted where he is. But, sirs, be sudden in this execution, with all obdurate. Do not hear him plead, for Clarence is well spoken, and might move your hearts to pity if you mark him. Tut, tut, my lord, we will not stand to prate. Talkers are no good doers, be assured. We will go to use our hands and not our tongues. I like you, lads. <laughs> About your business, straight. dreams of ugly sights, and as I am a Christian faithful man, I would not spend another such a night nor turn to buy a world of happy days. He thought that I had broken from the tower and was embarked to cross to Burgundy, and in my company my brother Gloucester, who from my cabin tempted me to walk upon the hatches. He thought that Gloucester stumbled and in falling struck me, that thought to stay him overboard into the tumbling billows of the main. Oh, Lord, methought what pain it was to drown, what dreadful noise of water in mine ears, what sights of ugly death within mine eyes. I passed, methought, the melancholy flood, with that sour ferryman which poets write of unto the kingdom of perpetual night. The first that there did greet my stranger soul was my great father-in-law, Renowned Warwick, a shadow like an angel with bright hair dabbled in blood, and he shrieked out aloud, Clarence has come, false, fleeting, perjured Clarence that stabbed me in the field by Tewksbury. Seize on him, furies, take him unto torment. With that, methought a legion of foul fiends environs me, and how in mine ears such hideous cries that with a very noise I, trembling, Wait, and for a season after could not believe but that I was in hell. Ah, I have done these things that now give evidence against my soul for Edward's sake and see how he requites me. O oh God, the 
My deep prayers cannot appease thee, but thou wilt be avenged on my misdeeds, yet execute thy wrath in me alone. Oh, spare my guiltless wife and my poor babes. <laughs> Than to be tedious. Come, let him see our commission and talk no more. I am in this, commanded to deliver the noble Duke of Clarence to your hands. I will not reason what is meant hereby, because I'll be guiltless from the meaning. I'll to the king, and signify to him that thus I have resigned to you my charge. You may, sir, it's a point of wisdom. Fare you well. What? Shall we stab him as he sleeps? No, he'll say to us I'm cowardly. When he wakes. Why, he shall never wake until the great judgment day. Why, then he'll say we stabbed him sleeping. The urging of that word judgment hath bred a kind of remorse in me. What, art thou afraid? Not to kill him having a warrant, but to be down for killing him from which no warrant can defend me. I thought thou hast been resolute. So I am to let him live. I'll back to the Duke of Gloucester and tongue so. Nay, I pray thee stay a little. I hope this passionate humor of mine will change. <laughs> How just I feel thyself now? <laughs> Some certain dregs of conscience are yet within me. Remember our reward when the deed's done. Zooms, he dies. I forgot the reward. Where's thy conscience now? <laughs> oh, in the Duke of Gloucester's purse. When the Duke opens his purse to give us our reward, thy conscience flies out. It is no matter. Let it go. There's few and none will entertain it. What if it come to thee again? I'll not meddle with it. It makes a man a coward. A man cannot steal, but it accuseth him. A man cannot swear, but it checks him. A man cannot lie with his neighbor's wife, but it detects him. It fills a man full of obstacles. I am strong framed, he cannot prevail with me. Soft, he wakes. In God's name, what art thou? A man, as you are. But not as I am royal. Nor you as we are, loyal. Who brought you hither? Wherefore do you come? To, 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 to murder me? Uh, Aye. <laughs> You scarcely have the hearts to tell me so, and therefore cannot have the hearts to do it. Wherein, my friends, have I offended you? Offended us have you not, but the king. I shall be reconciled to him again. Never, my lord. Therefore, prepare to die. Are you drawn forth among a world of men to slay the innocent? What is my offense? Where is the evidence that doth accuse me? What lawful quest have given their verdict up unto the frowning judge? Or who pronounce a bitter sentence of poor Clarence's death before I be convicted by course of law? To threaten me with death is most unlawful. I charge you, as you hope for any goodness, that you depart and lay no hands on me. The deed you undertake is damnable. What we will do, we do upon command. And he that hath commanded is our king. Erroneous vassals, the great king of kings hath in the table of his law commanded that thou shalt do no murder. Will you then spurn at his edict and fulfill a man's? Take heed, for he holds vengeance in his hand to hurl upon their heads that break his law. How canst thou urge God's dreadful law to us when thou hast broken in such a degree? Alas, for whose sake did I that ill deed? For Edward for my brother, for his sake. He sends you not to murder me for this, for in that sin he is as deep as I. Thy brother's love, our duty, and thy fault provoke us hither now to slaughter thee. If you do love my brother, hate not me. I am his brother, and I love him well. If you are hired for me, go back again, and I will send you to my brother Gloucester, who shall reward you better for my life than Edward will for tidings of my death. You are deceived. Your brother Gloucester hates you. 
Oh, do not slander him, for he is kind. Come, you deceive yourself. Tis he that sends us to destroy you here. It cannot be, for he bewept my fortune, and hugged me in his arms, and swore with sobs that he would labor my delivery. Why, so he doth. When he delivers you from this earth's thraldom to the joys of heaven, make peace with God. For you must die, my lord. Oh, sirs, consider, they that set you on to do this deed will hate you for the deed. What shall we do? Relent and save your souls. Relent? No! Tis cowardly and womanish. Not to relent is beastly, savage, devilish. My friend, I spy some pity in thy looks. Come thou on my side and entreat for me. Look by to me! Continue this united league. I every day expect an embassage from my Redeemer to redeem me hence, and more to peace my soul shall part to heaven, since I have made my friends at peace on earth. <coughs> Rivers and Hastings, take each other's hand. Dissemble not your hatred, swear your love. By heaven, my soul is purged from grudging hate, and with my hand I seal my true heart's love. So thrive I as I truly swear the like. Take heed, you dally not before your king, lest he that is the supreme king of kings confound your hidden falsehood and award either of you to be the other's end. So prosper I as I swear perfect love. And I, as I love Hastings with my heart. <laughs> Madam, yourself is not exempt from this. Nor you, son Dorset, Buckingham, nor you. You have been factious one against the other. Wife, love Lord Hastings. Let him kiss your hand, and what you do, do it unfeignedly. There, Hastings, I will never more remember our former hatred. So thrive I and mine. This interchange of love I hear protest upon my part shall be inviolable. And so swear I. Now, princely Buckingham, seal you this league with thy embracements of my wife's allies, and make me happy in your union. Whenever Buckingham doth turn his hate upon your grace, but with all duteous love doth cherish you and yours, God punish me with hate in those where I expect most love. A pleasing cordial, princely Buckingham. Is this thy vow unto my sick heart? That <clears throat> There wanteth our brother Gloucester here to make a blessed period of this peace. And in good time, here comes Sir Richard Ratcliffe and the Duke. Good morrow, my sovereign king and queen and princely peers. A happy time of day. 
Happy indeed, as we have spent the day. Gloucester, we have done deeds of charity, made peace of enmity, fair love of hate between these two swelling wrong and sensed peers. A blessed labor, my most sovereign lord. If any among this princely heap, by false intelligence or wrong surmise, holds me a foe, if I unwillingly, or in my rage, have aught committed what is hardly borne to any in this presence, I desire to reconcile me to his friendly peace. Tis death to me to be at enmity. I hate it, and desire all good men's love. First, madam, I entreat true peace of you, which I will purchase with my duteous service. Of you, my noble cousin of Buckingham, if ever any grudge were lodged between us. Of you, and you, Lord Rivers, and of Dorset, that all without desert have frowned on me. I do not know that English man alive with whom my soul is any jot at odds, more than the infant that is born tonight. I thank my God for my humility. A holy day shall this be kept hereafter. I would to God all strifes were well compounded. My sovereign lord, I do beseech your highness to take our brother Clarence to your grace. My madam, have I offered love for this, to be so flouted in the royal presence? Who knows not the gentle duke is dead? Who knows not he is dead? <laughs> Who knows he is? All seeing heaven, what a world is this? Is Clarence dead? The order was reversed. But he, poor man, by your first order died. That a winged Mercury did bear. Some tardy cripple bore the countermand that came too lag to see him bury it. God grant that some less noble and less loyal nearer in bloody thoughts and not in blood deserve not worse than wretched Clarence did. And yet go current from suspicion. My brother killed no man, his fault was thought. And yet his punishment was bitter death. Who sued to me for this? Who, in my wrath, kneeled at my feet and bid me be advised? <laughs> Who spoke of brotherhood? Who spoke of love for him? <laughs> oh, poor soul. Oh God, I fear thy justice will take hold on me and you and mine and yours for this. <coughs> Come, Hastings, help me to my closet. <coughs> oh, poor Clarence. <coughs> of the queen looked pale when they did hear of Clarence's death. Oh, they did urge it still on to the king, but God will revenge it. Come, lords, do you go with me to comfort Edward with our company? We wait upon your grace. despair against my soul, and to myself become an enemy. What means this scene of rude impatience? To make an act of tragic violence. Edward, my lord, thy son, our king is dead. Why grow the branches when the root is gone? Why wither not the leaves that want their sap? If you will live, Lament, if die be brief, 
that our swift-winged souls may catch the kings, or like obedient subjects follow him to his new kingdom of ne'er changing night. Oh, <laughs> so much interest have I in thy sorrow as I had title in thy noble husband. I have bewept a worthy husband's death and lived with looking on his images, but now two mirrors of his princely semblance are cracked in pieces by malignant death, and I for comfort have but one false glass, which grieves me when I see my shame in him. Give me no help in lamentation. I am not barren to bring forth lament. All springs reduce their currents to mine eyes, that I, being governed by the watery moon, may send forth plenteous tears to drown the world. Was never widow, had so dear a loss. Was never mother, had a dearer loss. Alas, I am the mother of these moans. Pour all your tears. I am your sorrow's nurse, and I will pamper it with lamentation. Comfort, dear mother. God is much displeased that you take with unthankfulness his doing. Sister, bethink you like a careful mother of the young prince, your son. Send straight for him. Let him be crowned, in him your comfort lives. Drown desperate sorrow in dead Edward's grave, and plant your joys in living Edward's throne. <laughs> Sister, have comfort. All of us have caused to wail the dimming of our shining star, but none can help our harms by wailing them. Madam, my mother, I, I cry you mercy. I did not see your grace. Uh, humbly on my knee, I crave your blessing. God bless thee, and put meekness in thy breast. Love, charity, obedience, and true duty. Amen. And may I die a good old man, for that is the butt end of a mother's blessing. I marvel that her grace did leave it out. Though we have spent our harvest of this king, we are to reap the harvest of his son. Meseemeth good that with some little train forthwith from Ludlow, the young prince be sent hither to London to be crowned our king. Why with some little train, my lord of Buckingham? Mary, my lord, lest by a multitude the new healed wound of malice should break out. I hope the king made peace with all of us, and that the compact is true and firm in me. And so in me, and so I think in all. And be it so, and go we to determine who they shall be that straight shall post to Ludlow. Madam, and you, my sister, Will you go to give your censures in this business? My lord, whoever journeys to Prince, for God's sake, let us two not stay at home. For by the way, I'll sort occasion to part the queen's proud kindred from the prince. I, as a child, will go by thy direction. Towards Ludlow, then, for we'll not stay behind. Neighbors, Godspeed, give you good morrow. Doth the news hold of good King Edward's death? Aye, this too true. God help a while. Then masters look to see a troublous world. No, no. By God's good grace, his son shall ring. Woe to that lamb that's governed by a child. In him there's a hope of government. So stood the, so stood the state when Henry the Sixth was crowned in Paris, but at nine months old. Stood the state so? No, no, good friends, for then the king had virtuous uncles to protect his grace. Why, so hath this, both by his father and mother. Oh, full of danger is the Duke of Gloucester, and the queen's sons and brothers, hot and proud. And were they to be ruled, and not to rule, this sickly lamb might solace us before. Come, come. We fear the worst. All will be well. When clouds are seen, wise men put on their cloaks. All may be well, but if God sort it so, tis more than we deserve or I expect.
truly the hearts of men are full of fear. Before the days of change, still is it so. By a divine instinct, men's minds mistrust. But leave it all to God. Last night I heard they lay at Stony Stratford, and at Northampton they do rest tonight. Tomorrow or next day they will be here. I long with all my heart to see the prince. I hope he is much grown since last I saw him. But I hear no. They say my son of York has almost ordained him in his growth. I, mother, but I would not have it so. Why, my good cousin, it is good to grow. Grandam, one night as we did sit at supper, my uncle Rivers talked how I did grow more than my <laughs> brother. I, quoth my uncle Gloucester, small herbs have grace, great weeds do grow apace. And since methinks I would not grow so fast, because sweet flowers are slow and weeds make haste. <laughs> good faith, good faith. The saying did not hold in him that does object the same to thee. He was the wretchedest thing when he was young, so long of growing and so leisurely that, if his rule were true, he should be gracious. And so no doubt he is, my gracious madam. I hope he is, but yet that mother's doubt. A parlous boy! Go to, you are too shrewd. But madam, be not angry with the child. <laughs> Small pitchers have wide ears. <laughs> what news? Such news, my queen, as grieves me to report. How doth the prince? Well, madam, and in health, what is thy news? Lord Rivers and Lord Grey are sent to Pomfret prisoners. Who hath committed them? The mighty dukes, Gloucester and Buckingham. For what offense? The sum of all I can I have disclosed. Why, or for what the nobles were committed is all unknown to me, my gracious queen. I me. I see the ruin of my house. Accursed and unquiet wrangling days. How many of you have mine eyes beheld? My husband lost his life to get the crown. And often up and down my sons were tossed for me to joy and weep their gain and loss. Oh, let me die to look on earth no more. Come, come, my boy, we will to sanctuary. Madam, farewell. Stay, I will go with you. You have no cause. My gracious lady, go, go. I'll conduct you to the sanctuary. Cousin, my thought sovereign, the weary way hath made you melancholy. No, uncle, but our crosses on the way have made it tedious, wearisome, and heavy. I want more uncles here to welcome me. Sweet prince, the untainted virtue of your years hath not yet dived into the world's deceit. Those uncles which you want were dangerous. Your grace attended on their sugared words, but looked not on the poison of their hearts. God keep you from them, and from such false friends. God keep me from false friends, but they were none. My lord, the mayor of London comes to greet you. God bless your grace with health and happy days. I thank you, good my lord, and thank you all. I thought my mother and my brother York would long ere this have met us on the way. For I want a slug as Hastings that he comes not to tell us whether they will come or no. And in good time, here comes the sweating lord! Welcome, my lord! What? Will our mother come? Oh. On what occasion, God, he knows not I. The queen, your mother, and your brother York have taken sanctuary. The tender prince would fain have come with me to meet your grace, 
but by his mother was perforce withheld. Oh, fie, what an indirect and peevish course is this of hers? Good bishop, will your grace persuade the queen to send the Duke of York unto his princely brother presently? If she deny, Lord Hastings go with him, and from her jealous arms pluck him perforce. God forbid we should infringe the holy privilege of blessed sanctuary. Not for all this land would I be guilty of so great a sin. You break not sanctuary in seizing him. The benefit thereof is always granted to those whose dealings have deserved the place and those who have the wit to claim the place. Oft have I heard of sanctuary men, but sanctuary children, ne'er till now. <laughs> my grace, you shall overrule my mind for once. Come on. Lord Hastings, will you go with me? Good lords, make all the speed in haste you may. Say, Uncle Gloucester, if our brother come, where shall we sojourn to our poor nation? If I may counsel you, your highness should repose you in the tower. Then, where you please. And may be thought most fit for your best health and recreation. I do not like the tower of any place. <laughs> Richard of York, how fair is our noble father? <laughs> My dear lord! So must I call you now. Aye, brother, to our grief as it is yours. How fair is our cousin, the noble lord of York? I thank you, gentle uncle. Oh, my lord, you said that idle weeds are fast in growth. The prince, my brother, hath outgrown me far. He hath, my lord. And therefore is he idle. Oh, my, my good cousin, I, I must not say so. <laughs> then he is more beholding to you than I. My lord of York will still be cross in talk. Uncle, your grace knows how to bear with him. You mean to bear me, not to bear with me. Uncle, my brother mocks both you and me. Because that I am little, like an ape, <laughs> he thinks that you should bear me on your shoulders. <laughs> with what a sharp, provided wit he reasons. Uh, so cunning and so young is wonderful. Sweet prince. Will it please you go along? Myself and my good cousin of Buckingham will unto your mother to entreat her to meet you and welcome you to the tower. What? Will you go unto the tower, my lord? My lord, protector needs will have it so. I shall not sleep in quiet at the tower. Why? What should you fear? Mary, my uncle Clarence's angry ghost. My grandmother told me he was murdered there. I fear no uncle's dead. But nor none that live, I hope. And if they live, I hope I need not fear. But come, my lord, and with a heavy heart thinking on them, go I unto the tower. Oh, tis a parlous boy, bold, quick, ingenious, forward, capable. He is the mother's from the top to the toe. Well, let them rest. Come hither, Catesby. Thou art sworn as deeply to affect what we intend, as closely to conceal what we impart. Thou knowest our reasons are urged upon the way. What thinkst thou? Is it not an easy matter to make Lord William Hastings of our mind for the installment of this noble duke in the seat royale of this famous isle? He, for his father's sake, so loves the prince that he will not be one to aught against him. Will not he? he will do all and all as Hastings doth. Well then, no more but this. Go, gentle Catesby, and as it were far off, sound thou Lord Hastings how he stands affected unto our purpose. If he be willing, encourage him and tell him all our reasons. If he be led in, icy cold, unwilling, be thou so too, and so break off the talk and give us notice of his inclination. For we tomorrow hold divided counsels, wherein thyself shalt highly be employed. Commend me to Lord Hastings. Tell him, Catesby, his ancient knot of dangerous adversaries tomorrow are let blood at Pomfret Castle. My good lords both. My lord, what shall we do if we perceive Lord Hastings will not yield to our complots? 
chop off his head. And look, when I am king, claim thou of me the earldom of Hereford, and all the movables whereof the king my brother was possessed. I'll claim that promise at your grace's hand. And look to have it yielded with all kindness. <laughs> So it appears, by that I have to say. He dreamt. The boar had raised it off his helm. Besides, he says there are two counsels kept, and what may be determined at the one may make you and him to rue at the other. Go, fellow, go. Return unto thy lord. Bid him not fear the separated counsel. His honor and myself are at the one, and at the other is my good friend Catesby. Tell him his fears are shallow without an instance. Before his dreams, I wonder if he's so simple to trust the mockery of unquiet slumbers. Go, bid thy master rise and come to me, and we will both together to the tower, where he shall see the boar will use us kindly. I'll go, my lord, and tell him what you say. Many good morrows to my noble lord. Good morrow, Casey. You are early stirring. What news? What news in this our tottering state? It is a reeling world indeed, my lord. And I believe we'll never stand upright till Richard wear the garland of the realm. How wear the garland? Dost thou need the crown? Aye, my good lord. I'll have this crown of mine cut from my shoulders before I see the crown so far misplaced. But canst thou guess he doth aim at it? Aye, on my life, and hopes to find you forward upon his party for the gain thereof. And thereupon he sends you this good news, that this same very day your enemies, the kindred of the queen, must die at Pomfret. Hmm. Indeed, I am no mourner for that news, because they have been still my adversaries. But that I'll give my voice on Richard's side to bar my master's heirs in true descent. God knows, I will not do it to the death. Stanley, come on, where's your boar spear, man? Hear you the boy goes so unprovided. My lord, good morrow. Good morrow, Catesby. You may jest on, but by the holy rood, I do not like these several counsels. I, my lord, I hold my life as dear as yours. Thank you, but that I know our state secure. I would be so triumphant as I am. <laughs> the lords of Pomfret, when they rode from London, were jocund, and supposed their states were sure, and they indeed had no cause to mistrust, but yet you see how soon the day o'ercast. This sudden stab of rancor I misdoubt. Pray God, I say, I prove a needless coward. What? Shall we toward the tower? The day is come. Hear you not the news, my lord? Today the lord you talk of are beheaded. They, for their truth, might better wear their heads than some that have accused them wear their hats. But come, my lord. Let's away. Today shalt thou behold the subject die for truth, for duty, and for loyalty. God bless the prince from all the pack of you, a naught you are of damned bloodsuckers. Make haste. The hour of death is expiant. <laughs> of the coronation. Is all things ready for the royal time? It is, and wants but nomination. Tomorrow, then, I judge a happy day. Who knows the Lord Protector's mind herein? Who is most inward with the noble duke? Uh, your grace, we think, should soonest know his mind. We know each other's faces. For our hearts, he knows no more of mine than I of yours, or I of his, my lord, than you of mine. Lord Hastings, you and he are near in love. I thank his grace, I know he loves me well. But for his purpose in the coronation, I have not sounded him, 
nor he delivered his gracious pleasure any way therein. But you, my honorable lords, may name the time, and in the Duke's behalf, I'll give my voice. Mm. Mm. And noble lords and cousins all, good morrow. Mm. I have been long a sleeper. <laughs> But I trust my absence doth neglect no great designs which by my presence might have been concluded. Had you not come upon your cue, my lord, William Lord Hastings had pronounced your part, I mean your voice, for crowning of the king. Then Lord Hastings, no man might be bolder. His lordship knows me well and loves me well. <laughs> my lord of Ely, when last I was in Holborn, I saw good strawberries in your garden there. I do beseech you, send for some of them. Marry and will, my lord, with all my heart. Cousin of Buckingham, a word with you. Catesby hath sounded Lord Hastings in our business, and finds the testy gentleman so hot that he will lose his head ere give consent. Withdraw yourself a while, I'll go with you. We have not yet set down this day of triumph. Tomorrow, and my judgment is too sudden, for I myself am not so well provided as else I would be were the day prolonged. Where is my lord? <laughs> the Duke of Gloucester, I... I sent for these strawberries. <laughs> His grace looks cheerfully and smooth this morning. There's some conceit or other likes him well when that he bids good morrow with such spirit. I think there's never a man in Christendom can lesser hide his love or hate than he. For by his face straight shall you know his heart. What of his heart perceive you in his face by any livelihood he showed today? Mary, that with no man here he is offended. For work, he had shown it in his looks. I pray you all, tell me what they deserve that do conspire my death with devilish plots of damned witchcraft, and have prevailed upon my body with their hellish charms. The tender love I bear your grace, my lord, makes me most forward in this princely presence to doom the offenders, whosoe'er they be. I say, my lord, they have deserved death. And let your eyes be witness to their evil. Look how I am bewitched. Behold, my arm, like a sapling, withered up. And this is Edward's wife, that monstrous witch that doth with her witchcraft have marked me. If she have done this deed, my noble lord. If the protector of this damned witch, talks thou to me of if thou art a traitor, off with his head. Now by St. Paul, I will not dine until I have seen the same. Radcliffe, look that it be done. The rest of you that love me, come, go with me. Woe, woe for England and not a witch for me. For I, too fond, might have prevented this. Oh, Margaret, Margaret, now thy heavy curse is lighted on poor Hastings' wretched head. Come, come, dispatch. The Duke would be at dinner. Make a short shrift. He longs to see your head. Oh, bloody Richard, miserable England. I prophesy the fearfulest time to thee that ever wretched age hath looked upon. Come, lead me to the block. Bear him my head. <laughs> they smile at me, who shortly shall be dead. Come, cousin, canst thou quake and change thy color as if thou wert distraught and mad with terror? Tut, I can counterfeit the deep tragedian. Speak and look back and pray on every side, <laughs> intending. Deep suspicion. Oh. Ghastly looks are at my service time. <laughs> and force of smiles at any time to grace my stratagems. But what, can't be gone? He is, and see, he brings the man along. Lord Mayor, look to the drawbridge there. What the drawbridge? Nature, look at the wall. Lord Mayor, the reason we have sent Go down, get to defend the year or enemy. Guard our innocence, defend the door now. Be patient. He is Radcliffe and a friend. Here is the head of that ignoble traitor, the dangerous 
Hubris and unsuspected Hastings. So dear I loved the man that I must weep. I took him for the plainest, harmless creature that ever breathed upon this earth. A Christian! Would you imagine, or almost believe, were not that by great preservation, we live to tell it that the subtle traitor this day had plotted in the council house to murder me and my good lord of Gloucester? Had he done so? What? Think you we, against the form of law, would proceed thus rashly in the villain's death? But that the extreme peril of the case, the peace of England and our person's safety, enforced us to this execution. Now, fair to fall you, he deserved his death. And your good graces both have well proceeded to warn false traitors from the like attempts. Yet, had we not determined he should die until your lordship came to see his end, because, my lord, I would have had you hear the traitor speak and timorously confess the manner and the purpose of his treasons, that you might well have signified the same unto the citizens who happily may misconster us in him and wail his death. But, my good lord, your grace's words shall serve as well as I had seen or heard him speak. And do not doubt, right, noble princes both, but I'll acquaint our duty citizens with all your just proceedings in this case. That end, we invited your lordship here to avoid the censures of the carping world. Which, since you come too late of our intent, yet witness what you hear we did intend. And so, my good lord mayor, we bid farewell. Go after. After, cousin of Buckingham. The mayor towards Guildhall hides him in all post. There, at the meetest vantage of the time, infer the bastardy of Edward's children. Moreover, urge his hateful luxury and bestial appetites in change of lust, which stretched on to their servants, daughters, wives, even with his raging eye or savage heart, without control, lusted for prey. For a need thus to come close to my person, I tell them when that my mother went with child of that insatiate Edward, noble York, my princely father, then had wars in France, and by the just computation of the time found that the issue was not his begot. But touch it sparingly, as it were far off, because you know, my lord, my mother lives. <laughs> Doubt not, my lord. I'll play the orator as if the golden fee for which I plead were for myself. And so, my lord, adieu. Now to take order that no man or person have any recourse unto the princes. Here is the indictment of the good lord Hastings. Eleven hours have I spent to write it over, for yesternight by Catesby was it brought me. And yet, within these five hours, Hastings lived. Untainted, unexamined, free, at liberty. Here's a good world the while. Who is so gross that cannot see this palpable device? Yet who so bold but says he sees it not? Bad is the world, and all will come to naught when such ill dealings must be seen in thought. How now, how now, what say the citizens? And now, by the holy mother of our Lord, the citizens are mum, say not a word. Touched you the bastardy of Edward's children. I did, left nothing fitting for your purpose, untouched or slightly handled in discourse. And when my oratory drew toward end, I bid them that did love their country's good cry, God save Richard, England's royal king! And did they so? No, so help me God, they speak not a word. <laughs> but 
like dumb statues or breathing stones, stared each on other and looked deadly pale. Which, when I saw some followers of mine own at the lower end of the hall, curled up their caps, and some ten voices cried, God save King Richard! And thus I took the vantage of those few. Thanks, gentle citizens and friends, quoth I. This general applause and cheerful shout argues your wisdom and your love to Richard. And even here broke off and came away. What tongueless blocks were they? Would not they speak? Will not the mayor and his brethren come? The mayor is here at hand, intense and fear. Be not you spoke with, but by mighty suit. And look, you get a prayer book in your hand, and stand between two churchmen. Good, my lord, for on that ground I'll make a holy descant and be not easily won to our requests. Play the maid's part. Still answer nay, and take it. I go, and if I plead it, nay to thee for myself. No doubt will bring us to a happy issue. Go, go, up to the leg. Lord Mayor comes. Oh, welcome, my lord. I dance attendance here. I think the Duke will not be spoke with all. Now, Catesby, what says your lord to my request? He is within, with two right reverend fathers, divinely bent to meditation. And in no worldly suits would he be moved. Return, good Catesby, to the gracious Duke. Tell him myself, the mayor, and aldermen, and deep designs in matter of good moment, no less importing than our general good, are come to have some conference with his grace. I'll signify so much unto him straight. <laughs> My lord, this prince is not an Edward. He is not lulling on a little bed, but on his knees at meditation. Happy were England would this virtuous prince take on his grace the sovereignty thereof. Mary, God defend his grace should say us nay. I fear he will. Go, here Catesby comes again. Now, Catesby, what says your lord to my request? He wonders to what end you have assembled such troops of citizens to come to him. His grace not being worn thereof before, he fears, my lord. You mean no good to him. By heaven! We come to him in perfect love, and so once more return and tell his grace. When holy and without religious men are at their beats, tis much to draw them thence. So sweet is zealous contemplation. See where his grace stands, we do clergymen, and see. Most gracious prince, lend favorable ear to our requests and pardon us the interruption of thy devotion and right Christian zeal. My lord, there needs no such apology. I do beseech your grace to pardon me. I do perceive I have done some offense that seems disgracious in the city's eye, and that you have come to reprehend my ignorance. You have, my lord. Would it might please your grace and our entreaties to amend your faults? Else wherefore breathe I in a Christian land? Hmm. Know then, it is your fault that you resign the supreme seat, the throne majestical, the sceptered office of your ancestors, your state of fortune and your due of birth, the lineal glory of your royal house, to the corruption of a blemished stock, which to recur we hardly solicit your gracious self to take on you the charge and kingly government of this your land, not as protector, steward, substitute, but as successively from blood to blood. Your right of empery, your own. Your love deserves my thanks, but my deserts unmeritable shuns your high request. First, if all obstacles were cut away and my path made even to the crown, as of right revenue and due of birth, but so much is my poverty of spirit, so mighty, and so many my defects, that I would rather hide me in my greatness than in my greatness covet to be hid. But God be thanked. There is no need of me. The royal tree hath left us royal fruit, which mellowed by the stealing hours of time will 
well become the seat of majesty, and make us, no doubt, happy by his reign. You say that Edward is your brother's son. So say we too, but not by Edward's wife, for first was he contract to Lady Lucy. Your mother lives a witness to his vow. That one put off a poor petitioner. A beauty waning and distressed widow seduced the pitch and height of his degree to base declension and loathed bigamy. By her, in his unlawful bed, he got this Edward, whom our manners call the prince. Then do good, my lord, take to your royal self this proffered benefit of dignity. Do good, my lord, your citizens entreat you. Alas, why would you heap this care on me? I am unfit for state and majesty. I do beseech you all not to take amiss. I cannot, nor I will not yield to you. If you refuse it, as in love and zeal, loath to depose the child, your brother's son, as well we know your tenderness of heart. Yet know, where you accept our suit or no, your brother's son shall never reign our king, for we will plant some other in the throne to the disgrace and downfall of your house. And in this resolution, here to leave you. Come, citizens, you shall drink no more. Oh, do not swear, my lord of Buckingham. My lord of Buckingham. Hold against you, prince. My lord. Accept their suit. If you deny them, all oh, the land will rue it. Will you enforce me to a world of Masters. Masters. Oh, come again. I am not made of stones, but penetrable to your kind entreaties. Cousin of Buckingham. Uh, and sage, grave men, if you will buckle fortune on my back, I must have patience to endure the low. But God doth know, and you may partly see how far I am from the desire of this. God bless your grace! We see it and will say it! In saying so, you but say the truth. Then I salute you with this worthy title. God save King Richard, England's worthy king! Amen! <laughs> Tomorrow may it please you to be crowned? When you will please, for you will have it so. as yourselves to graduate the gentle princes then. Kind sister, thanks. We will enter all together. Sir Richard Ratcliffe, pray you by your leave, how doth the prince and my young son of York? Right well, dear madam. By your patience, I may not suffer you to visit them. The king has simply charged the contrary. The king? Who's that? I mean the Lord Protector. The Lord protect him from that kingly title. Hath he set bounds between their love and me? I am their mother. Who shall bar me from them? I am their father's mother. I will see them. Their aunt, I am in law. In love, their mother. Bring me to their sights. No, madam, no. I may not leave it so. I am bound by oath. And therefore, pardon me. Come, madam, you must straight to Westminster, there to be crowned Richard's royal queen. Oh, cut my lace asunder, that my pent hearts may have some scope to beat, or else I swoon with this dead killing news. Mother, how fares your grace? Oh, Dorset, speak not to me, get thee gone. If thou wilt outstrip death, go cross the seas and live with Richmond from the reach of hell. Go, hide thee, hide thee from this slaughterhouse, lest thou increase the number of the dead and make me die the thrall of Margaret's curse, nor mother, wife, nor England's counted queen. Full of wise care is this your counsel, madam. Take all the swift advantage of the hours. You will have letters from me to my son in your behalf to meet you on the way. 
Be not tamed tardy by unwise delay. Oh, my accursed womb, the bed of death, a cockatrice hast thou hatched to the world. Come, madam, come. I in all haste was sent. Oh, would to God that this inclusive verge of gold metal that must round my brow be red hot steel to sear me to my brains. Anointed, let me be with deadly venom and die ere man can say, God save the queen. Go. Go, poor soul. I envy not thy glory. No? Why? When he that is my husband now came to me as I followed Henry's course, when scarce the blood was well washed from his hands, oh, when I say I looked on Richard's face, this was my wish. Be thou, quoth I, accursed for making me so young, so old a widow, and when thou wets, let sorrow haunt thy bed. And be thy wife. If any be so made more miserable by the life of him than thou hast made me by my dear Lord's death, lo, ere I can repeat this curse again within so small a time my woman's heart grossly grew captive to his honey words and proved subject to mine own soul's curse, which hitherto hath held mine eyes from rest, for never yet one hour in his bed did I enjoy the golden dew of sleep, but with his timorous dreams was still awaked. Besides, he hates me for my father Warwick and will no doubt shortly be rid of me. Poor hearted you. I pity thy complaining. No more than my soul, I mourn for yours. Go thou to Richmond, and good fortune guide thee. Go thou to Richard, and good angels tend thee. Go thou to sanctuary, and good thoughts possess thee. I to my grave where peace and rest lie with me. Pity, you ancient stones, those tender babes whom envy hath immured within your walls, rough cradle for such little pretty ones, Rude, ragged nurse, old, sullen playfellow for tender princes. Use my babies well. So foolish sorrows bids thy stones. Farewell. Buckingham. My gracious sovereign. Give me thy hand. Thus highly by thy advice and thy assistance is King Richard seated.
But shall we wear these glories for a day? Or shall they last, and we rejoice in them? Still live they, and forever let them last. Edward still lives. Think now what I would speak. Say on, my gracious sovereign. Cousin, I say I would be king. Why, so you are, my thrice-renowned lord. Am I king? <clears throat> Tis so, but Edward lives. True, noble prince. Oh, bitter consequence. Cousin, thou wast not wont to be so dull. Shall I be plain? I wish the bastards dead, and I would have it suddenly performed. What sayst thou now? Speak suddenly, be brief. Your grace may do your pleasure. Tut, tut, thou art all ice. Thy kindness freezes. Say, have I thy consent that they shall die? But give me some little breath. Some pause, dear lord, before I positively speak in this. I will resolve you herein presently. I reaching Buckingham grows circumspect. Lord Norfolk. My lord. Know you not any whom corrupting gold will tempt onto a close exploit of death? I know a discontented gentleman whose humble means match not his haughty spirit. Gold were as good as twenty orators and will no doubt tempt him to anything. What is his name? His name, my lord, is Tyrrell. Go call him hither. The deep, revolving, witty Buckingham no more shall be neighbor to my counsels. <coughs> How now, Lord Stanley? What's the news? No, my loving lord. The Marquis Dorset, as I hear, is fled to Richmond. <laughs> Come hither, Norfolk. Rumor it abroad that Anne, my wife, is very grievous sick. I will take order for her keeping close. Look how thou dreamst. I say again, give out that Anne, my queen, is sick and like to die. must be married to my brother's daughter, or else my kingdom stands on brittle glass. Murder her brothers and then marry her. Uncertain way of gain. But I am in so far in blood that sin will pluck on sin. Is thy name Tyrrell? James Tyrrell, and your most obedient subject. Art thou indeed? Prove me, my gracious lord. Darest thou to kill a friend of mine? Please you, but I'd rather kill two enemies. Why then thou hast it, two deep enemies, foes to my rest, are those that I would have thee deal upon. Cyril, I mean those bastards in the tower. Let me have open means to come to them, and soon I will rid you from the fear of them. Oh, thou say sweet music. Hark, <coughs> come hither, Cyril. There is no more but so. Say that it be done, and I will love thee and prefer thee for it. I will dispatch it straight. My lord, I have considered in my mind the late request that you did sound me in. Let that rest. Dorset is fled to Richmond. I hear the news, my lord. Stanley, she is your wife's son. <coughs> well looking. My lord, I claim the gift. I do by promise for what your honor and faith is pawned. The earldom of Hereford and the movables which you promise I shall possess. Stanley, look to your wife. If she convey letters to Richmond, you will answer what it. What says your highness to my just request? I do remember me. Henry the Sixth did prophesy that Richmond should be king when Richmond was a little peevish boy. A king, perhaps. My lord. How chance the prophet could not at that time have told me, I being by, that I should kill him. My lord, your promise for the earldom. Aye, what's o'clock? 
I am thus bold to put your grace in mind of what you promised. Well, but what's a clock? Upon the stroke of ten. Let it strike. Why let it strike? Because that like a jack, thou keep'st the stroke betwixt thy begging and my meditation. I am not in the giving vein today. And is it thus? Repays he my deep service with such contempt? Made I him king for this? Oh, let me think on Hastings and be gone, to Brecknock while my fearful head is on. All's health, my sovereign lord. Kind, Tyrrell. Am I happy in thy news? The chaplain of the tower hath buried them, but where to say the truth, I do not know. Come to me again, Tyrrell, soon, and after supper, and thou shalt tell me the process of their death. Meantime, but think how I may do thee good, and so farewell. Mm -hmm. Sons of Edward sleep in Abraham's bosom, and Anne, my wife, hath bid this world good night. For now I know that Breton Richmond aims at young Elizabeth, my brother's daughter, and by that knot looks proudly on the crown. To her I go, a jolly, thriving wooer. My lord. Good or bad news that thou comest in so bluntly? Bad news, my lord. Ely is fled to Richmond, and Buckingham back with the hardy Welshman is in the field, and still his power increaseth. Ely with Richmond troubles me more near than Buckingham and his rash levied strength. Go, muster men. My counsel is my shield. We must be brief when traitors brave the field. <laughs> and drop into the rotten mouth of death. Oh, my poor princess! Oh, oh my tender babes! <laughs> if yet your gentle souls fly in the air, hover about me with your airy wings, and hear your mother's lamentation, Hover about her. <laughs> Say that right for right hath dimmed your infant morn to aged night. So many miseries have crazed my voice that my woe-wearied tongue is still and mute. <laughs> Edward Plantagenet, why art thou dead? Plantagenet doth quit Plantagenet. Edward for Edward pays a dying debt. Wilt thou, O oh God, fly from such gentle lambs and throw them in the entrails of the wolf. When didst thou sleep when such a deed was done? When holy <laughs> Harry died and my sweet son. Oh, who hath any cause to mourn but we? If ancient sorrow be most reverent, give mine the benefit of seniory. I had an Edward, till a Richard killed him. I had a husband, till a Richard killed him. Thou hadst an Edward, till a Richard killed him. Thou hadst a Richard, till a Richard killed him. I had a Richard too, and thou didst kill him. I had a Rutland too, thou helpst to kill him. Thou hadst a Clarence too. And Richard killed him. From forth the kettle of thy womb hath crept a hellhound that doth hunt us all to death. That excellent grant, tyrant of the earth, thy womb let loose to chase us to our graves. Oh, upright, just, and true disposing God, how do I thank thee that this carnal 
her praise on the issue of his mother's body, and makes her new fellow with others moan. Oh, Harry's wife, triumph not in my woes. God witness with me, I have wept for thine. Bear with me. I am hungry for revenge, and now I cloy me with beholding it. Thy Edward, he is dead, that killed my Edward. <laughs> the other Edward dead, to quit my Edward. <laughs> Thy clarity is dead, that stabbed my Edward. <laughs> Richard yet lives. Hell's black intelligencer. Cancel his bond of life, dear God, I pray, that I may live and say the dog is dead. Oh, thou didst prophesy. The time would come that I should wish for thee to help me curse that bottled spider, that foul bunched back toad. <laughs> I called thee then, vain flourish of my fortune. I called thee then, poor shadow, painted queen. The presentation of but what I was, a queen in jest, only to fill the scene. Where is thy husband now? Where be thy brothers? Where be thy two sons? <laughs> Wherein dost thou joy? <laughs> Who sues and kneels and says, God save the queen? <laughs> Decline all this and see what now thou art. For a happy wife, a most distressed widow. For joyful mother, one that wails the name. For one being sued too, one who humbly sues. For queen, a very caitiff crowned with care. Thus had the course of justice whirled about, and left thee but a very prey to time, having no more but thought of what thou wast. To torture thee the more, being what thou art, thou didst usurp my place, and dost thou not usurp the just proportion of my sorrow? Now, thy proud neck bears half my burdened yoke. From which, even here I slip my wearied head and leave the burden of it all on thee. <laughs> Farewell, your wife and queen of sad mischance. These English woes shall make me smile in France. <laughs> oh, thou wilt shield and curses, stay a while. And teach me how to curse mine enemies. <laughs> Forbear to sleep the night and fast the day. Compare dead happiness with living woe. Think that thy babes were sweeter than they were. And he that slew them fouler than he is. That tring thy loss makes the bad cause or worse. Revolving this will teach thee how to curse. My words are dull. Now quicken them with thine. Thy woes will make them sharp. And pierce <laughs> like mine. <coughs> If so, then, be not tongue-tied. Go with me, and in the breath of bitter words, let smother my damned son, that thy two sweet sons smother 
anointed. Strike, I say! Art thou my son? Aye, and I thank God, my father, and yourself. Then patiently hear my impatience. Mother, I have a touch of your condition. Oh, let me speak! Do then, but I'll not hear. I will be mild and gentle in my words. And brief, good mother, for I am in haste. Art thou so hasty? I have stayed for thee, God knows, in torment and in agony. And have I not come at last to comfort you? No, by the holy rood, thou know'st it well. Thou camest on earth to make the earth my hell. Therefore, take with thee my most grievous curse, which in the day of battle tired thee more than all the complete armor that thou wearest. My prayers on the adverse party fight, and there, the little souls of Edward's children whisper the spirits of thine enemies and promise them success and victory. Bloody thou art, bloody will be thy end. Shame serves thy life and doth thy death attend. Though far more cause Yet much less spirit to curse abides in me. I say amen to her. Stay, madam. I must talk a word with you. I have no more sons of the royal blood for thee to slaughter. For my daughters, Richard, they shall be praying nuns, not weeping queens, and therefore level not to hit their lives. You have a daughter called Elizabeth, virtuous and fair, royal and gracious. And must she die for this? Oh, let her live, and I'll corrupt her manners, stain her beauty, slander myself as false to Edward's bed. Throw over her the veil of infamy so she may live unscarred of bleeding slaughter. I will confess she was not Edward's daughter. Wrong, not her birth. She is a royal princess. To save her life, I'll say she is not so. Her life is safest only in her birth. And in that safety died her brothers. Well, you speak as if I had slain my cousins. Cousins, indeed. And by their uncle, cousin. Comfort. Kingdom. Kindred. Freedom. Life. Whose hands soever launch their tender hearts, thy head all indirectly gave direction. Madam, so thrive I in my enterprise and dangerous success of bloody wars, as I intend more good to you and yours than ever you and yours by me were harmed. What good is covered with the face of heaven to be discovered that can do me good? The advancement of your children, gentle lady. Up to some scaffold there to lose their heads. Under the dignity and height of fortune, the high imperial state of this earth's glory. Flatter my sorrow with report of it. Tell me, what state, what dignity, what honor canst thou demise to any child of mine? Even all I have. I, myself, and all will I withal endow a child of thine. Be brief, lest that the process of thy kindness last longer telling than thy kindness date. Then know that from my soul I love your daughter, and do intend to make her queen of England. Well then, who dost you mean shall be her king? Even he that makes her queen, who else should be? 
What? Thou? Even so. I think you are. How canst thou woo her? That I would learn of you, as one being best acquainted with her humor. And wilt thou learn of me? Madam, with all my heart. Sent to her by the man that slew her brothers, a bear of bleeding hearts. Thereon in brave Edward and York, then happily she will weep. You mock me, madam. This is not the way to win your daughter. There is no other way, unless thou couldst put on some other shape and not be Richard that hath done all this. Say that I did all this for love of her. Nay, then indeed she cannot choose but hate thee, having bought love with such a bloody spoil. If I did take the kingdom from your sons to make amends, I'll give it to your daughter. If I have killed the issue of your womb to quicken your increase, I'll beget mine issue of your blood upon your daughter. I cannot make you what amends I would, therefore accept such kindness as I can. Dorset, your son, with a fearful soul, leads discontented steps in foreign soil. This fair alliance quickly shall call home to great dignity and high preferment. The king that calls your beauteous daughter wife familiarly shall call thy Dorset brother. Again will you be mother to a king, and all the ruins of distressful times repaired with double riches of content. So go, my mother, to thy daughter go. Prepare her ear to hear a wooer's tale. Put in her heart the aspiring flame of golden sovereignty. What were I best to say? Her father's brother would be her lord? Shall I say her uncle? Or he that slew her brothers and her uncles? Under what title shall I woo for thee, that God, the law, my honor, and her love can make seem pleasing to her tender years? Infer Fair England's peace by this alliance. Which she shall purchase with still lasting war. But tell her the king that may command and treat. And at her hands, which the king's king forbids. Say she shall be a high and mighty queen. To wail the title as her mother doth. Say I will love her everlastingly. But how long shall that title ever last? Sweetly enforced unto her fair life's end. And how long fairly shall her sweet life last? As long as heaven and nature lengthen As long as hell. Richard likes of it. Your reasons are too shallow and too quick. Oh, no. My reasons are too deep and dead. Too deep and dead for infants in their graves. Harp not on that string, madam. That is past. Harp on it still shall I till heartstrings break. Now by my George, my garter, and my crown. Profane, dishonored, and the third usurped. I swear. I nothing for this is no oath. If something thou would swear to be believed, swear then by something that thou hast not wronged. And by myself. Thyself is self misused. Now by the world. Tis full of thy foul wrong. My father's death. Thy life hath it dishonored. Well then, by heaven! <clears throat> Heaven's wrong is most of all. If thou hadst feared to break an oath by him, the imperial medal circling now thy head had graced the tender temples of my child. And both the princes had been breathing here, which now two tender bedfellows for dust thy broken faith hath made the prey for worms. What canst thou swear by now? Time to come. Swear not by time to come, 
For that thou hast misused, ere used, by times ill-used repast. As I intend to prosper and repent. So thrive I in my dangerous affairs of hostile arms. Myself, myself, confound. Heaven and fortune bar me happy hours. Day, yield me not thy light, nor night thy rest. Be opposite all planets of good luck to my proceeding, if with dear heart's love, immaculate thoughts, holy devotion, I tender not your beauteous princely daughter. Therefore, dear mother, for I must call you so, be the attorney of my love to her. Plead what I will be, not what I have been, not my deserts, but what I will deserve. Urge the states and necessity of times, and be not peevish found in great designs. Shall I be tempted of the devil thus? Aye, if the devil tempt you to do good. Yet thou didst kill my children. But in your daughter's womb I bury them. I go. Write to me very shortly, and you shall understand from me her mind. Bear her. My true love's kiss. And so farewell. <laughs> Relenting fool. And shallow changing woman. And now, what news? Most mighty sovereign, on the western coast rideth a puissant navy. To our shores, tis thought that Richmond is their admiral. And there they hull, expecting but the aid of Buckingham to welcome them ashore. Radcliffe posts some friend to the Duke of Norfolk. Radcliffe thyself, or Catesby. Where is he? Here, my good lord. Catesby, fly to the Duke. I will, my lord, with all convenient haste. Radcliffe, come hither. Post ahead to Salisbury. When thou comest thither, dull, unmindful villain, why stayest thou here and goest not to the duke? First, mighty liege, tell me your highness' pleasure, what from your grace I shall deliver to him. Oh, true, good Catesby. Bid him levy straight the greatest strength and power he can make, and meet me suddenly at Salisbury. I go. What may it please you shall I do at Salisbury? Why? What wouldst thou do before I go? Your highness told me I should post before. Thy mind is changed. Lord Stanley, what news with you? Richmond is on the seas. Now let him sink and be the seas on him. He makes for England here to claim the crown. Is the chair empty? Sword on Swain. Is the king dead? The empire unpossessed. What or heir of York is there alive but we? And who is England's king but great York's heir? What makes he upon the seas? Unless for that, my liege, I cannot guess. Unless for that he comes to be your liege, you cannot guess wherefore the Welshman comes. Thou wilt revolt, and fly to him, I fear. No, my good lord, therefore mistrust me not. Where are your powers, then, to beat him back? Where be thy tenants and thy followers? Are they not now upon the western shore, safe conducting the rebels from their ships? No, my good lord, my friends are in the north. Cold friends to me! What do they in the north when they should serve their sovereign in the west? They have not been commanded, mighty king. Please, if your majesty to give me leave, I'll muster up my friends and meet your grace, where and what time your majesty shall please. Well, thou wilt leave to join with Richmond, but I'll trust thee not. Most mighty sovereign! You have no cause to hold my friendship doubtful. I never was, nor never will be false. Go then, muster men, but leave behind your son, George Stanley. Look, your heart be firm, or else his head's assurance is but frail. So deal with him as I prove true to you. Now in Devonshire, Sir Edward Courtney and the haughty prelate, with many more confederates, are in arms. In Kent, my liege, the Guilford's
Russians are in arms, and every hour more competitors flock to the rebels, and their power grows strong. My lord, the army of the great Bucky. There! Take that back to outrage! Better news! Your grace mistakes. The news I bring is good. The Buck Buckingham's army is dispersed and scattered, and he himself has fled. No man knows whither. If any will advise a friend, post reward to him that bring the traitor in. Such proclamation hath been made, my lord. My liege, the Duke of Buckingham is taken. That is the best news, that the Earl of Richmond is with a mighty power landed at Milford is colder news, but yet they must be told. Catesby, take order that Buckingham be brought to Salisbury. The rest of you march on with me. A royal battle may be won and lost. Or my son, George Stanley, is franked up in hold. If I revolt, off goes young George's head. The fear of that holds off my present aid. So get thee gone, commend me to thy lord. Tell him that the queen hath heartily consented. He should espouse Elizabeth, her daughter. But tell me, where is princely Richmond now? At Pembroke, where ever left to Wales, and many others of great need and worth. Where to London do they bet their power, if by the way they do not fought with all? Well, hie thee to thy lord. I kiss his hand. My letter will resolve him of my mind. Will not King Richard let me speak with him? No, my good lord. Therefore, be patient. This is All Souls' Day, Catesby, is it not? It is. Why then, All Souls' Day is my body's doomsday. Thus, Margaret's curse falls heavy on my neck. When he, quoth she, shall split thy very heart with sorrow, remember, Margaret was a prophetess. Come, lead me, Catesby, to the block of shame. Wrong hath but wrong, and blame the due of blame. It is, my leash, and all things are in readiness. Radcliffe, my lord. Send out a perseverant at arms. Bid Lord Stanley bring his power before sunrising. Ah, blessed his son George. Fall into that blind cave of eternal night. <laughs> Fill me a bowl of wine. Bid my guard watch. Leave me. Radcliffe, about the mid of night, come into my tent and help to arm me. Leave me, I say. Fortune and victory sit on thy helm. I, by attorney, bless thee from thy mother, who prays continually for Richmond's good. In brief, for so the season bids us be, prepare thy battle early in the morning, and set thy fortune to thy arbitrament of bloody strokes and mortal staring war. I, as I may, that which I would, I cannot, with best advantage would deceive the time and aid thee in this doubtful shock of arms. But on my side I will not be too forward. Lest being seen, thy brother, tender George, be executed in his father's sight. Farewell. The leisure and the fearful time cuts 
valiant and speed well. Good lords, conduct him to his regiment. I prescribe the troubled thoughts to take a nap, lest the lady slumber please me down when I should not with wings of victory. to death. Tomorrow in the battle, think on me and fall thy edgeless sword. Spare and die. Thou offspring of the house of Lancaster, the wronged heirs of York do pray for thee. Good angels, guard thy battle. Live and flourish. Let me sit heavy on thy soul tomorrow. Rivers, that died at Pomfret, despair and die. Think upon Gray, and with guilty fear let fall thy lance, despair and die. Awake, and think our wrongs, and Richard's bosom will conquer him. Awake and win the day. Bloody and guilty, guiltily awake and in a bloody battle end thy days. Think on Lord Hastings, despair and die. Quiet, untroubled soul, awake, awake. Arm, fight, and conquer for fair England's sake. Dream on thy cousins smothered in the tower. Let us be laid within thy bosom, Richard, and weigh thee down to ruin, shame, and death. Thy nephew's souls bid thee despair and die. Sleep, Richmond, sleep in peace and wake in joy. Good angels guard thee from the boar's annoy. Live and beget a happy race of kings. Edward's unhappy sons do bid thee flourish. Richard, thy wife, that wretched Anne, thy wife, that never slept a quiet hour with thee, now fills thy sleep with perturbations. Tomorrow in the battle, think on me and fall thy edgeless sword. Despair and die. Thou quiet soul, sleep thou a quiet soul. Dream of success and happy victories. Thy adversary's wife will not pray for thee. The first was I that helped thee to the ground. The last was I that felt thy tyranny. Oh, in the battle, think on Buckingham and die in terror of thy guiltiness. Side. And Richard fall in height of all his pride.
find out my wealth. Mercy, Jesus. Soft I did but dream. Oh, coward conscience, or dost thou afflict me? The lights burn blue. It is now dead midnight. Cold, fearful drops stand on my trembling flesh. What? Do I fear myself? There's none else by. The Richard loves Richard. That is, I am I. Is there a murderer here? No. Yes, I am. Then fly. What, from myself? Great reason why? Must I revenge? What, myself upon myself? Alack, I love myself! Wherefore, for any deeds that I myself have done unto myself. Oh no. Alas, I rather hate myself. Grateful deeds committed by myself. I am a villain. Yet I lie. I am not. Fool, thyself speak well. Fool, do not flatter. My conscience hath a several thousand tongue, and every tongue a several tale, and every tale condemns me for a villain. I shall despair. There is no creature loves me. And if I die, no soul will pity me. Nay, wherefore should they, since I myself find in myself no pity for myself? Methought souls of all those I had murdered came to my tent, and every one did threat tomorrow's vengeance on the head of Richard. Who's there? My lord, the early village cock hath twice done salutation to the morn. Your friends are up and buckle on their armor. Oh, Radcliffe, Radcliffe, I fear. Shadows tonight have struck more terror at the soul of Richard than can the substance of ten thousand men, armed and proof and led by shallow Richmond. Nay, good my lord, be not afraid of shadows. She's not yet dead. Come, go with me. How have you slept, my lord? Oh, the sweetest sleep and the fairest boating dreams have I since my father. The thoughts, the souls whose bodies Richard murdered had come to my tent and cried on victory. How far is the morning, is it? Upon the stroke of four. Why, then, it is time to arm and give direction. Dear loving countrymen, God, in our good cause, fight upon our side. The prayers of holy saints and wronged souls, like high-reared bulwarks, stand before our faces. Richard, except those whom we fight against had rather have us win than him they follow. For who is he they follow? Truly, gentlemen, a bloody tyrant and a homicide. One that hath ever been God's enemy. And when you fight against God's enemy, God, in justice, will ward you as his soldiers. If you do swear to put a tyrant down, you sleep in peace, the tyrant being slain. If you do fight for safeguard of your wives, your wives will welcome home the conquerors. If you do fight to free 
free your children from the sword, your children's children quits it in your age. That in the name of God and all these holy rites, advance your standards, draw your willing swords, so drop boldly and cheerfully. God and St. George, Richmond and victory! Not the sun be seen today. The sky doth frown and lower upon our army. Not shine today! Why, what is that to me more than to Richmond? The self same heaven that looks sadly on me frowns on him. Arm, arm, my lord, the foe vaunts in the field. Come, bustle, bustle, comparison, my horse. Call Lord Stanley, bid him bring his power. I will lead forth my soldiers to the plain. Go, gentlemen! Every man to his charge! Let not our babbling dreams affright our souls, for conscience is a word that cowards use, devised at first to keep the strong in awe. Our strong arms be our conscience, swords our laws. March on, join bravely, let us toots pell-mell, if not in heaven, then hand in hand to hell. Remember whom you are to cope with all, a sort of vagabonds, rascals, and runaways, a scum of Bretons and base lackey peasants whom their o'ercloyed country vomits forth to assure destruction and desperate adventures. And who doth lead them? But a paltry fellow, a milksop, one that never in his life felt so much cold as over shoes in snow. Let's whip these stragglers o'er the seas again. Lash hence these o'erweening rags of France, these famished beggars who for want of means poor rats had hanged themselves. If we be conquered, let men conquer us. Will these enjoy our wives? Lie with our daughters, ravish our lands! Hark, I hear their drums. Right, gentlemen of England, fight boldly, yeomen. Draw, archers, draw your arrows to the head. Stanley, will he bring his power? My lord, he doth deny to come. Off with his son George's head! My lord, the enemy is past the marsh. After the battle, let George Stanley die. A thousand hearts are great within my bosom. Advance our standards, set upon our foes. Our ancient word of courage, fair St. George, inspire us with the spleen of fiery dragons. Upon them, victory sits in our hands! Yeah! 
Is ours. The bloody dog is dead! Courageous Richmond! Well hast thou acquit thee. Lo, here, these long usurped royalties from the dead temples of this bloody wretch to grace thy brows withal. Wear it and make much of it. Great God of heaven, say amen to all. Uh, yet tell me. Is young Lord Stanley living? He is, my lord, and safe in Leicester Town, whither, if you please, we may withdraw us. Proclaim a pardon to the soldiers fled, that in submission we'll return to us. Then, as we obtain the sacrament, we will unite the white rose and the red. The smile of heaven upon this fair conjunction, that long hath frowned upon their enmity, what traitor hears me and says not amen? England hath long been mad and scarred herself. The brother blindly shed the brother's blood. The father rashly slaughtered his own son. The son compelled, been butchered to the sire. All this divided York and Lancaster, divided in their dire division. Oh, now, let Richmond and Elizabeth, the true succeeders of each royal house, by God's fair ordinance, Conjoin together, and let their heirs, God, if thy will be so, enrich the time to come with smooth-faced peace, with smiling plenty and fair, prosperous days. Now, civil wounds have stopped, peace lives here again, that she may long live here, God say, Amen. Amen! <laughs>